humid South Dakota air at 1 atmosphere, 35 degrees Celsius, and 80% humidity enters an HVAC system at a rate of 10 cubic meters per hour, where it is to be isobarically cooled to 22 degrees Celsius. I want to know the cooling rate required to accomplish this process and how much condensation occurs. I will point out before we start that I had actually intended for this number to be in cubic meters per minute, but I wrote cubic meters per hour, so we just kind of have to roll with it. Well, 10 cubic meters per hour is going to be a very low volumetric flow rate, which means we're going to have a very low mass flow rate, which means that everything is going to be pretty small. So I guess for the purposes of this analysis, just assume it's a dollhouse instead of an actual house. We're entering the HVAC system for a really cool dollhouse. 10 cubic meters of air every hour. So I have air entering at 35 degrees Celsius and 80% relative humidity. And being cooled to 22 degrees Celsius. The first question I have to answer is, is this simple cooling or not? And to answer that question, let's look at this on the chart. We are starting with a temperature of 35 degrees Celsius and a relative humidity of 80%. Well, 35 degrees Celsius is going to be this line here. And 80% relative humidity is going to be this line here. So I see that those intersect all the way up here. So my cooling process is going to start by movement to the left, horizontally, until it reaches the 100% relative humidity line. If I encounter the desired set point temperature first, then I'm going to have simple cooling. So if I cooled from 35 to like 31, I wouldn't have any condensation occurring yet. But in order to cool down to 22 degrees Celsius, I have to go all the way down to this temperature, which I cannot do with direct horizontal displacement. So instead, my process is going to involve going to the left until I encounter the 100% relative humidity line, at which point I will follow that down and to the left until I hit my desired temperature. So this is my end state point here. So since I have cooling with dehumidification, I'm going to draw that as a cooling coil with the opportunity for condensation to occur and for the resulting water to be able to be collected and to leave the system at state, let's call it W. So I have atmospheric air entering as state one, I have atmospheric air exiting as state two, and then I have a state point W, which is the mass flow rate of condensation that we're looking for. So at state two, I know the relative humidity has to be 100% because I'm cooling while I am condensing water out of the air. So if I'm okay with chart lookups, I can use these two independent intensive psychrometric properties to look up any other property that I need. Let's start this analysis with a mass balance and an energy balance. Just like before, I'm going to set up a mass balance on the dry air which because I have steady state operation of an open system with one entering atmospheric air and one exiting atmospheric air and no opportunities for dry air to add, be added or removed throughout the process. That means m.a1 is equal to m.a2, which I can just call m.a. Again, for the water, because I have steady state operation, the mass flow rate of water in has to equal the mass flow rate of water out. 
I have one opportunity for water to enter my system, that is as water vapor at state one. And I have two opportunities for water to leave my system, that's as water vapor at state two, and as m dot w. So just like we did in the adiabatic saturation analysis, it's going to be most convenient for me to write this by dividing everything by m dot a, because then I can write it in terms of intensive properties. Because m dot v1 divided by m dot a, which is the same as m dot v1 divided by m dot a1, which is the same as mv over ma, which is just the humidity ratio at state one, is equal to m dot v2 over m dot a, which is the same as m dot v2 over m dot a2, which is the same as mv2 over ma2, which is the humidity ratio at state two, plus m dot w over m dot a. So I will write the mass flow rate of water is equal to m dot a times the quantity omega 1 minus omega 2. For my energy balance on my control volume, I have a steady state operation of an open system, e dot in has to equal e dot out. I have control volume and no opportunities for work. I'm neglecting changes in kinetic and potential energy. So this is going to simplify down to m dot a1 times h1 is equal to q dot out plus m dot a2 h2 plus m dot w h w. I have one opportunity for energy to enter my system, that's as atmospheric air at state one. Some of that energy leaves as q dot out. Some of that energy leaves at state w, and the rest of it leaves as atmospheric air at state two. So I can write q dot out is equal to m dot a times h1 minus h2 minus m dot w h w. And then I can plug in my representation of m dot w in terms of m dot a and omega one minus omega two, at which point I have m dot a times h one minus h two minus m dot a times omega one minus omega two times h w. M dot a could be factored out further if I wanted to, and m dot a is going to be calculated by taking the volumetric flow rate divided by the specific volume. h one, omega one, h two, and omega two are going to be looked up on the chart or calculated by using my psychrometric property calculations. HW I'm going to be approximating by treating it as a freshly condensed substance that hasn't been given the opportunity to be supercooled or compressed. So HW is about HF and I'm going to say the temperature at state W is closer to T2 than it is to T1. So let's use HF at T2. So dollhouse volumetric flow rate of 10 cubic meters per hour, teeny tiny number. And again, that's volumetric flow rate of atmospheric air and dry air and water vapor. And then I'm going to divide by the specific volume at state one. So I need to determine H1 omega one and the specific volume of the atmospheric air at state one. And I need to look up H2 and omega two. So there's my setup. I use T1 and phi one to determine H1, omega one and V1. I use phi two and T2 to determine H2 and omega two. And then I'm assuming that the substance that leaves at state W is approximately a saturated liquid at T2. So either I use my psychrometric calculations to determine those five properties and then look up HF, or I can assume that the chart is close enough 
look up those five properties in the chart, and then look up HF on the steam tables. In the interest of time, let's use the chart and let's look up HF. My temperature is T2 is 22 degrees Celsius, so I am looking up the HF value at 22, which is 92.33. And then for my chart lookups, at state one, I have a specific volume of oh, 0 0.912, 0 0.913. Let's call it 0 0.9125, just for arbitrary precision. Imply that we're extra confident in our number that we're not that confident about. Omega one is going to be about 29. Actually, if I erase this, I can probably read it a little bit better. 29.1, maybe. And again, that's grams of water per kilogram of dry air on this particular chart. H1 is going to be... So this is the 100 line. This is the 110 line. So it's going to be really close to 110. Yeah, let's just call it 110. 110 kilojoules per kilogram of dry air. And then at state two, we have a relative humidity of 100%. And a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to call my enthalpy 65.6, And then my humidity ratio at state two, going to be 0.9, Seventeen, essentially on the nose. Let's call that seventeen grams of water per kilogram of dry air. Now we have everything we need to be able to finish the question. I will start with my mass flow rate of dry air. That's going to be ten cubic meters per hour divided by zero point nine one two five. Cubic meters cancel. I'm left with kilograms of dry air per hour. One hour is 3,600 seconds. Therefore, my mass flow rate of dry air is going to be 0 0.003 kilograms per second. Then my total rate of heat rejection is going to be that mass flow rate multiplied by H1 minus H2, which is going to be 110 minus 65.5. That's going to be kilojoules per kilogram of dry air multiplied by kilograms of dry air per second, which is going to yield kilojoules per second, which is a kilowatt. And then I'm going to subtract M1 A again kilograms of dry air per second, multiplied by the enthalpy difference, excuse me, multiplied by the humidity ratio difference, which is going to be 29.1, come on calculator, 29.1 minus 17, and that's in grams of water per kilogram of dry air. So kilograms of dry air are going to cancel, and I'm going to be left with grams of water per second, 
multiplied by a specific enthalpy of the water in kilojoules per kilogram of water. So I need to divide that quantity by 1000 in order to get that into kilograms of water per second. Then I can multiply by 92.33 kilojoules per kilogram of water to yield kilojoules per second. And then, as is tradition, we forget at least one of the parentheses. Let's double check that that's actually written correctly. You know, that is good enough, calculator. And we get a rate of heat rejection of 0 0.132 kilowatts. That's a pretty small rate of heat rejection for a house, but probably pretty normal for a souped up dollhouse. Then for part B, we're calculating the mass flow rate of water. So that's just this equation right here. So I'm going to take my mass flow rate of dry air. I'm going to multiply by my difference in humidity ratios again. And this wants grams per second. So I'm taking kilograms of air per second multiplied by grams of water per kilogram of dry air, which means I'm going to yield an answer in grams of water per second. And I get 0 0.0368. So before we leave this question, let me point out that a 100% relative humidity at the outlet of your air conditioning process is awfully uncomfortable. To make humans comfortable, we would typically overcool this and then reheat it to get it to a more reasonable humidity. I mean, if we were considering the same exact example problem, but instead of just cooling until it reached 22 degrees Celsius and then stopping, if we wanted to hit 22 degrees Celsius and 50% relative humidity, what we'd actually have to do is cool until we got to the correct humidity ratio and then heat back up until we get to the correct temperature. So we'd have to cool all the way down to, what, a little under 11 degrees Celsius and then heat it back to 22 degrees Celsius. That's why actual air conditioning processes are so inefficient, relatively speaking, because you are expending so much energy to cool so much and then spending more energy to heat it back up again. You can get a little bit of return on investment by recycling some of the heat, but generally speaking, it is a very expensive, energetically speaking, process to do this cooling to a relative humidity less than 100%. When we have dehumidification occurring. <laughs>